we talk about blood thinners in our dry daily courses, and it's generally accepted that you don't really have much of an increased risk of bleeding, whether you're on blood thinners or whether you're not on blood thinners with dry needling. The American Physical Therapy Association states that it's an absolute contraindication on a patient that's on blood thinners if you cannot easily palpate for hemostasis, and then it's just a relative contraindication if you can easily palpate for hemostasis. Even though that's what the APTA says, the literature really has not shown an increased risk of bleeding whether a patient is on blood thinners or whether they're not on blood thinners, as long as their INR is within a therapeutic range. There's a really good article that was published in 2022 by some researchers that looked at specifically dry needling in patients on anticoagulants and compared that to uh, lots of other medical procedures that occur with patients on anticoagulants. I want to talk a little bit about that article because it really is a good article and I'd encourage you to look it up and, and read it in its entirety because it gives some great information. But then I also want to tell you a story about a therapist who needled a patient that was on blood thinners uh, and it kind of went a little south, had a, some extensive bruising and ultimately the therapist got sued and unfortunately and ultimately the therapist lost and they had to pay a, a large sum of money. Uh, so I wanted to go into that case a little bit and talk about some of the takeaways that, that we can learn from that uh, that lawsuit. But first, let's refresh our memory on antithrombotic medications, their types, and um, go into a little bit of details about INRs and what that is and how uh, it's measured and what those reference ranges mean, and then just to help us better understand how we can protect ourselves as clinicians that are performing dry needling, because at the end of the day, we do have to protect ourselves from uh, lawsuits, whether they're frivolous or not. And we can talk about some, some ways that we can kind of reduce our risk if we're going to needle someone that's on any type of blood thinner. According to the Physical Therapist and Performance of Dry Needling, uh, an educational research paper that was produced by the uh, American Physical Therapy Association Department of Practice and State Government Affairs, that was back in January of 2012, it was basically a big white paper that the APT put out regarding dry needling. They state that an absolute contraindication includes into a muscle area in patients on anticoagulant therapy or with thrombocytopenia, where hemostasis by palpation can't be easily carried out. According to that same research paper about APTA, a, a relative contraindication and precaution includes patients on anticoagulative therapy, thrombocytopenia, etc. If hemostasis with palpation can be easily carried out, then you should just exercise caution. So it goes from an absolute contraindication if you cannot easily palpate for hemostasis, and it becomes a relative contraindication if you can easily palpate for hemostasis. Unfortunately, the APTA does not really quantify that for you. They leave it up to the individual therapist to decide what is superficial enough to easily palpate for hemostasis versus what is too deep to easily palpate for hemostasis. So uh, they, again, kind of leave it up to your imagination. As a reminder, when we look at different types of antithrombotic drugs, you have uh, two categories. You have antiplatelet agents and you have anticoagulants. Antiplatelet agents include uh, aspirin and also includes a P2Y12 receptor blocker. Oftentimes those are uh, prescribed together. And then it's referred to as a dual antiplatelet therapy when you combine aspirin with that other receptor blocker. And then for anticoagulants, you have a vitamin K antagonist, uh, which can be abbreviated as a VKA. You have a direct oral anticoagulant, which is abbreviated DOACS uh, or DOAC. And then you have heparin. And then heparin can be uh, further subdivided into unfractionated heparins and then low molecular weight heparins. Collectively, people tend to refer to any type of antithrombotic drug as a blood thinner. But we know antithrombotic drugs are either antiplatelet or they're anticoagulant type drugs. But, you know, generally all your patients are just going to call them blood thinners if they're on blood thinners. So if they're on blood thinners, a lot of times they get their INR checked. So what is an INR? An INR is an international normalized ratio. It measures the time it takes for blood to clot. INR is calculated based on results of a uh, prothrombin time test. Uh, that's abbreviated as PT. So uh, generally you'll see this ordered as a PT INR and then you'll get a, an INR uh, and then we have ranges for INR. So in a normal healthy person, the range is 1.1 or below. So if you're not on any type of quote blood thinner, then your normal range is 1.1 or below. If you need to be in a therapeutic range, an INR range of two to three is considered therapeutic in individuals taking blood thinners. And then an INR range above 4.9 is considered critical and there's certainly an increase, uh, severe increase in bleeding risk if your INR is that high. Remember, an INR is like the atmosphere. The higher the number goes, the thinner the air is. So the higher the INR uh, value goes, the thinner the blood is. Just like if you were to go up into the atmosphere, you couldn't breathe because the air is so thin. Well, the INR is, as the INR rate climbs, then the blood is getting thinner and thinner and thinner. When we look at some of the previous research on anticoagulants and acupuncture, uh, most of what we see is in the acupuncture world because they've, they've been doing needles a lot longer than we have in the physical therapy world. So according to Kim and colleagues in 2014, they looked at uh, anticoagulants and acupuncture and they found no reports of major bleeding. 
and the microbleeding, which they defined as bleeding which stopped within 30 seconds, occurred in only slightly more patients taking an anticoagulant, so 4.8%, than patients not on an anticoagulant, 3%. So you're looking at a 1.8% difference of patients that uh, had acupuncture and they were on a blood thinner versus not on a blood thinner, and they only had a 1.8% increase in, uh, in bleeding and bruising if they were on an anticoagulant. And then no significant difference in the amount of bruising between patients on anticoagulants and patients not. So again, you're looking at 2% versus 1.3%. And then a study on acupuncture among hospitalized patients taking warfarin found very little bleeding and that a higher INR value did not predict a higher risk of bleeding after acupuncture. And now a new article that was recently published by uh, Minos and colleagues in uh, the Pain Research and Management Journal that looked at specifically at dry needling and antithrombotic drugs. They go into amazing detail about uh, about dry needling with anticoagulant therapy. They looked at other procedures involving needles such as venipuncture, uh, EMG analysis, and Botox injections. They also looked at ultrasound guided fine needle aspirations. Uh, they looked at all kind of cool stuff as it relates to needles and patients on anticoagulant therapy. And then they also compare uh, the needle type that we use in dry needling versus the needle types that are used in other forms of medicine. Uh, so you have a dry needling needle, which is not beveled, uh, and then you have a hypodermic needle, which is beveled. Beveled meaning it has a, a real sharp edge, kind of like a scalpel. The whole purpose of that is to cut through the skin to be able to get into the tissue, such as like uh, when you're getting venipuncture and they're trying to draw blood out of your vein. If you ever look at that needle, it looks like it's got a sharp beveled end uh, that basically is like a scalpel, to, and the whole purpose is to slice through your tissue. So quoting from this article, considering the type of needle, the degree of potential tissue damage is dependent on whether the needle is beveled. The potential for tissue damage and bleeding is greater with a hypodermic needle than with a solid filament needle, which is what we use in dry needling. I would definitely encourage you to look up this article and just read it in, in its entirety because this really is a good article. The DOI is pasted uh, uh, on the screen, so you can just copy it down and you can go straight to it. It's a public access article, so you can get the full text version for free. But what these researchers concluded, venipuncture and other invasive procedures such as ultrasound-guided fine needle aspiration biopsy and botulinum injections are performed regularly in patients who are taking anticoagulants, and they have been proven to be safe. They do not cause a major bleeding event. Therefore, taking antithrombotic medication should not be considered an absolute contraindication for dry needling techniques. So that's what these researchers uh, state, that it's not an absolute contraindication for dry needling techniques. If you remember from the educational research paper put out by the APTA in 2012, they state that dry needling in a patient with anticoagulants is an absolute contraindication if you can't easily palpate for hemostasis, and it's a relative contraindication if you can easily palpate for hemostasis. So uh, this article uh, obviously is you know, a full 10 years newer. They're staying, saying that uh, antithrombotic medication should not be considered an absolute contraindication for dry needling techniques. So that's you know, good news, good research-backed uh, idea behind how we should do dry needling on patients with anticoagulants. So how did a therapist get sued? Kind of interesting. Here's the story. A PT needled an older gentleman's uh, gluteal region, and then the older gentleman had what they quoted as terrible bruising that occurred afterwards. The patient was on blood thinners. Uh, the PT did not verify the patient's INR status prior to performing dry needling. The therapist knew that the patient was on blood thinners, but they didn't uh, go the step further and try to figure out what the patient's INR status was before they poked needles in them. Uh, ultimately, the case went to a jury trial, and the jury decided for the plaintiff, so the therapist lost. Most likely it went to jury trial because this therapist, I'm, I'm doing some speculating here, most likely it went to jury trial because this therapist uh, malpractice insurance was like, there ain't no way we're going to lose this. Like, okay, he had a bruise. <laughs> what's, what's the big deal, right? Uh, and the research shows that you really don't have much of an increase of ble bleeding after uh, dry needling, whether you're on, or after acupuncture, whether you're on blood thinners or whether you're not on blood thinners. But this went all the way to jury trial, and unfortunately the jury decided for the plaintiff. And the therapist lost. So the therapist, uh, malpractice insurance, most likely had to pay a big sum of money. I don't know how much, but uh, it went all the way to trial and they lost. So you know it was, you know it was some money. It was a little surprising the outcome of that jury trial. But uh, anytime you have a jury trial, now there is precedent in the in the law files that uh, you know a therapist caused some extensive bruising on somebody on blood thinners where they did dry needling, and then uh, the patient sued them and the patient won. So that is. Uh, that is in the in the records now, as, as they say. So uh, it could that definitely happen again to another therapist. So there were some recommendations that were taken away from that court decision. Clinicians should verify if the patient is on uh, antithrombotic drug. So you should certainly ask the patient if they're on any type of antithrombotic drug, which we do that anyway. But here's where we you have to kick it up a notch now. If the patient is on an antithrombotic drug and dry needling is to be performed, the clinician should verify the patient's last INR score 
and have a record of that score sent from the office. So the, the physician, the, the PA's office, the nurse practitioner's office that ordered that lab test. Uh, so the clinician can paste, place it in their medical record. Uh, unfortunately, since the therapist did not know the patient's INR status, the jury decided against the therapist. There were expert witnesses on, on both sides of this argument in the trial. Uh, some expert witnesses said, like, look, you, you don't have to know their INR because it's not enough of an increased risk of bleeding. And then you had other expert witnesses for the plaintiff that said, hey, look, you got to know the INR because if this guy had a super high INR, then the therapist shouldn't have stuck needles in him anyway. And they actually make a good point. So because the therapist did not know the patient's INR, uh, the INR could have been five and he could have <laughs> you know, just had blood flowing out of him like water uh, for all the therapists knew. But uh, because the patient didn't, because the therapist didn't have the INR, uh, the specific INR score, and didn't have it placed in the medical record, the jury ultimately decided against the therapist. So this is something that I'm going to have to change my behavior with a little bit because uh, I don't routinely get INR scores from patients that are on anticoagulants because the research has said it's really not that big of a deal. Uh, even this new research, 2022, that came out by Munoz uh, and colleagues. They basically said it's not that big of a deal. You don't have that big of an increase in bleeding. But now we have a lawsuit that was won by the plaintiff against the therapist. So there is case law out there that says a therapist should have gotten the INR score and they didn't. And because they didn't, they were ultimately held liable. So I'm, I'm going to have to change my behavior a little bit here uh, when I'm needling a patient on anticoagulants. If I choose to needle them, uh, then it looks like I'm going to need to start getting an INR score, INR score. And it looks like you're probably going to need to start getting an INR score, too. INR score too. I know that's pretty crazy that the therapist got sued because they didn't know the patient's INR value before they dry needled uh, the patient. Uh, so there's case law out there that says you know you should get an INR value before you dry needle a patient that's on some type of quote blood thinner. I was just talking to my wife about this. My wife is a cardiac nurse practitioner and uh, she kind of rolled her eyes and she was like you don't check INR on every patient that's on a blood thinner. And I was like what do you mean? She was like some medications don't require INR to be checked. So that just throws a monkey wrench into the entire <laughs> entire equation. Uh, some of the medications you're assumed to be within range because you're on the medication, so they don't routinely check INR. Uh, so mm, this <laughs> again, a little little monkey wrench thrown into there. Uh, you know, according to this case law, though, because this therapist lost, and the recommendation from the case was that if you are going to needle a patient on anticoagulants, uh, on you know, quote blood thinners. You need to know their INR value before you uh, can needle the patient. So, so there's that.